What's up friends, family, and my fellow sufferers? It's your boy Danny, fresh in the flesh, making it all make sense on YouTube's most criminally underrated channel. If this is your first time here and you think you might be interested in nutritional theory, weightlifting, postural restoration, the skeptical philosophy of Pyrrho, existential psychology, existential philosophy, theology, the principles of post-Keynesian economics, and what happens when I take all those ideas and throw them into the blender on high speed? Consider making me your YouTube homie. Just remember while you're watching, if you dig the vibe, like and subscribe. Welcome to the very first, the inaugural three minute takedown. If you've been hanging around here for any length of time, you know that it's usually more like a 30 minute takedown. That's not my fault. The reason that it takes at least 30 minutes for me to even get started talking about a subject is because the entire freaking world is so Twitterfied and TikTokized that everything is already oversimplified. I don't want to contribute to that problem. Note well that I'm not opposed to simplification itself or responsible dilettantism at all. You don't have to be an expert to treat a subject with the requisite or the appropriate amount of complexity. That's my entire shtick after all. There are two other big reasons that it's not my fault, the first of which can be highlighted with one of my favorite quotes. Famous Scottish-American nationalist and the father of national parks, John Muir, once said, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. It's all connected, man. What the interconnectedness of all things means for you and me is that if you tug on one thread, you're tugging on the whole freaking ball of yarn. This makes any particular boundary line, starting point or stopping point, sort of arbitrary. This is the case with all classification schemes because ultimately, salience is in the eye of the beholder and it is not an inherent trait of the beheld. For example, here's Mike the Vegan talking about what he perceives to be an important similarity between humans and rabbits. Our digestive tract simply remains herbivorous. But it's funny how that mentality has actually crept its way into educational materials like this illustration of a comically short human digestive tract like one you would expect for an omnivore. This is compared to an herbivore, the rabbit. It just doesn't do justice to our average 23 foot long small intestine, which lands us right in about the same ratio between torso length and digestive tract length as that rabbit. Now, Mike believes that this similarity that he perceives between human beings and rabbits is indicative of the fact that humans are also herbivorous or meant to be herbivores like rabbits. But Mike doesn't mention one important difference between rabbits and human beings that overshadows any alleged similarity, at least in my opinion. Rabbits are coprophagic animals. Now, what this means is that rabbits eat their own shit. <laughs> and humans, as far as I'm aware, the ones that I know, do not. The second reason that it usually takes me so long to talk through an issue is due to something called Brandolini's Law, which goes a little something like this. The amount of energy needed to refute bullshit is an order of magnitude larger than is needed to produce it. It only takes a silly vegan one minute to come up with some bullshit that it takes me 10 minutes to fully deconstruct. I'm operating at a 10 to 1 ratio here. What I intend to do, however, in this series is break Brandolini's law. I'm gonna do my damnedest to deconstruct these devilish and absurd dietary dogmas in three minutes instead of 10. These are typically dogmas that are gonna be primarily promulgated by extremely online vegans. However, not exclusively by them because bullshit comes in many flavors. I'm not promising you that these are always going to clock in at three minutes. <laughs> I will never exceed seven or eight and I will usually keep it under five, but we're not always going to hit the three minute target. I'm sorry. And lastly, as you move through this YouTube playlist, feel free to use the YouTube chapters feature. Those are the little timestamps in the video description down below to skip the intro because the intro is going to be the exact same in each and every one of these three minute takedown. That's TMTD videos. Okay. I'm here to chew gum and smash the algorithm and I'm all out of gum. 
Okay, let's put three minutes on the clock. Uh, if you've spent any amount of time in internet nutrition circles, you've no doubt come across vegans making the claim that our stomach acid, that is human stomach acid, is weak. Carnivorous animals swallow their food whole, relying on extremely acidic stomach acid uh, to break down flesh and kill dangerous bacteria in it, which would otherwise sicken or kill them. Our stomach acids, by comparison, are much weaker. Strong acids aren't needed to digest pre-chewed fruits and vegetables. Linked in the description down below is my primary reference for today's video, which is going to be this study. I'm gonna quote from this study at length uh, to introduce a few key points. Recent research in gastric health suggests that the pH environment of simple stomached vertebrates serves a more prominent function as an ecological filter capable through its acidity of killing microbial taxa that would otherwise colonize the intestines. Hmm, that's interesting. The highly acidic stomachs of carnivores serve a very similar function. More and more, data seem to suggest that species-specific communities in the human gut appear relatively resistant to perturbation, in large part because the acidic human stomach prevents frequent colonization of the gut by large numbers of foodborne microbes. What does this mean? It means that short of a fecal transplant, you can STFU about the gut microbiome. Why? Because it's not really affected by what you're eating because your stomach acid acts as a filter. Now, the authors of this study looked high and low for data on the subject, but alas, given its primary role in digestion, stomach pH has been measured in far fewer taxa than might be expected. For instance, to the best of our knowledge, no data on stomach pH exists for any hominid other than humans, and surprisingly few data exist for primates more generally. Right out of the gate, we run into a pretty big obstacle, uh, which should preclude both vegans and ideological carnivores from making any of the bold pronouncements on this subject that they tend to make. There's just not enough data about other species. The researchers set out to answer this question, um, and they explained their methods as follows. We calculated a mean pH for the entire stomach if values were presented for multiple locations, such as the fundus, body, and pyloric regions. If studies provided both baseline and post-feeding values, we used the baseline pH. When not fasting, pH may vary depending on factors including diet and time since feeding. Just how acidic was the human stomach? You might get the impression from figure one that human beings who were selected as representative of the entire omnivore note well, trophic group, uh, had a pH similar to that of other omnivores, which is somewhere around three. However, when you look at table one, not figure one, table one of the study and find the actual pH value of the human stomach, you'll see that it clocks in around half of that value at 1.5. Eh, the pH of the human stomach is at the same level as most of the scavengers in the study. So, because vegans are in a cult and just filled up with cognitive dissonance, can't fill up on broccoli. <laughs> Once a vegan learns this fact, the goalpost move and the claim changes. Here's an example of the new and improved claim from Vegan Life magazine. Our digestive systems struggle to handle meat, and this is due in part to the length of our intestinal tract. Carnivores have short intestinal blah 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 blah. Do we struggle to digest meat? Not at all. In fact, we digest meat with maximum digestive efficiency, creating minimum digestive residue in the process. Now, I would highly encourage you to read the Roar of the Wolverine uh, articles that I've linked in the description down below, which explains what happens to a human being when he gets a jejunostomy. While he was in the hospital waiting on a transplant, the contents of his stomach were essentially directly emptying into an, an ostomy bag. Here's the money quote. Never once did we see any solid chunks of meat. I became so curious about this that I once swallowed the largest chunk of meat I could possibly get down without choking. Because of the shortness of my bowel, it only took about 20 minutes for my stomach to empty into the ostomy bag. Better than two hours later, still no signs of any meat chunks. What was always clogging the ostomy tube were pieces of vegetables that were not fully chewed. So, in an ironic twist, it turns out that what human stomach acid is actually too weak to digest is plant matter.
And here's a bonus fact for you. People that get a full gastrectomy, that's a removal of the entire stomach, um, are actually encouraged to eat meat and other animal products. Not only does the human stomach uh, break down meat highly efficiently all by itself, the small intestine can fully digest meat that completely bypasses the human stomach. Once a vegan learns these facts, the goalposts move again and the claim changes again. Carnivore stomachs secrete hydrochloric acid, meaning their gastric pH levels are maintained around one to two, even with food present. Now the claim being made is that human beings couldn't possibly be meat eaters or carnivores or carnivorous because their stomach pH rises above 1.5 when they ingest food or when there's food in the stomach. Remember when I told you earlier to remember why the researchers in the study utilized the pH value of the fasted state and why it was important to do so? This is why. So, what do we know? We know that the acid in the human stomach is as strong as the stomach acid in most facultative scavengers. We know that the human stomach is actually really freaking good at breaking down meat and not so great at breaking down vegetables. We also know that we don't even have to rely on the human stomach to digest meat because the small intestine is perfectly capable of digesting meat all by itself. This renders the claim made by vegans that carnivorous animals rely on their highly acidic stomachs to break down flesh entirely irrelevant when it comes to human beings. All right, family, I say it's pretty dang clear from everything that we've learned today that human beings are well adapted for eating meat and that we've doubly demolished this dangerous dietary dogma. Hey, thanks for sticking around. You must have really enjoyed the video if you did. So, do your boy Danny a solid and leave me a comment down below. Let me know your thoughts on the subject. What you liked about the video, what you didn't like about the video, and what other subjects you want to see me handle and take down in three minutes in the future. Fuch. It's your boy Danny reminding you that you are beautiful, capable, and strong, which means that you are good enough for whatever slings, arrows, and outrageous fortune fate cooks up and sends your way. And you're going to stay that way because you are going to eat meat and move weight. Chuck a deuce.